Welcome to the church at Station Hill. We are so glad that you're here. I have met some of you this morning, some of you who are brand new to us. So a special word uh, of welcome to you guys. Uh, If you are, in fact, new to us, uh, and if you wouldn't mind as a gift to us, we would love it if you would fill out the bottom part uh, of this uh, slip of paper that you received as you walked in, a bulletin. Uh, On the bottom of that is just what we call a communication card. It's your way of just letting us know, hey, I was here this morning. Uh, If you have anything you want to let us know, if you have a prayer request, anything like that, that's a great way to do that. Fill it out. Tear it off. Drop it in the offering later in today's service. Or if you like, and I would like, uh, walk on back and meet me uh, in the back uh, of the uh, worship center at the end of the service. Shake my hand. I'd love to get a chance to meet you, and you can give me your card there as well. Uh, Also, I want to let you know, next weekend is a big weekend for our church. You're going to hear more about that later in today's service, but one of the things I wanted to let you know about is next Sunday night. Uh, That is our chance to get together as a family, as a church, and just hang out, to eat a meal together, uh, bring a side, bring a dessert, uh, come prepared to just eat and fellowship and have a great time. Uh, We are going to gather for a few minutes and hear a little bit about what's coming up in the fall, some of the great opportunities that we have for you to connect, to get to know other people, to dive deeper into God's Word, etc., etc. It's going to be great. So come on, join us for the family gathering uh, next Next Sunday, uh, uh, next Sunday night, uh, and I know that you'll be blessed by doing that. For right now, let's go ahead and stand. Find some of those new folks I was talking about, some folks you haven't met yet. Uh, shake their hand, tell them welcome to the church at Station Hill.
do not fail you all grow weary you're the defender of the weak you comfort those in need you lift us up on wings like eagles you are again, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Let's reflect on that now as we sing how good our God is. of your love 
ashes of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reign. I'll run into your arms. I'll run into your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So many things in the world want our attention, the distractions and the busyness, but God wants to remind us that he just asks for us to be still. Let him be God. Let him fight for you. Whatever battle you are facing this week, you might have had an awesome week, but some of you might have struggled. Whatever that is, take this time to be still. Know that he is God. This is a newer song. If you know this song, feel free to worship with us, sing along with us. If not, just be still, be silent, listen to his words as they may speak to you this morning. Let's sing together.
Jesus, we do know this morning as you enter in this place, in this presence. In Jesus' name we pray. You know, there's so many things that I think about when I think about Guatemala, but it's the people and it's the experiences that God has used to teach me through those people. They are the most warm, humble, gracious people that you'll get to know. It's a good mix of, of working alongside the kids. Some of the older kids can jump in there and help. Um, that's specifically really helpful for the kids to see men working in those situations because a lot of children in Guatemala are mostly around uh, ladies because the men a lot of times are just absent. There's absent fathers, uh, the men travel a lot to find any work. So for the kids to see a group of guys out there working on something for them, it really inspires them, I think. I really think there's something to be said about the bond that is created with your teammates when you go. Um, you end up working side by side with people you may not normally be in community with, although you know them, you may not travel in the same circles, and you get to work side by side uh, with them and, and getting to know them as well. And you form a bond that lasts forever. Every time you see that person in the community or at church or on social media, you, you know that you share that bond of, of being in that place at that time and creating memories together. So I plea, come, journey with us. We'd love to take you with us. I pray that you are not content. I pray that your heart is stirred and that you take that step of faith and obedience and that you come with us. So I really can't say it any better than uh, Amay just did. I do hope that some of you are praying and thinking about going on a mission journey with us this fall. If you are thinking about going to Guatemala, you have about one week uh, before applications are due. So those are due on August 5th. Um, maybe it's just something that you've kind of felt a little stir in your heart, but you're not really sure. You have questions. I'll be at the missions table after the service. I would love to talk to you. I'm not going to put a hard sell on you just a soft sell. Um, but, uh, I, you know, we do need people on that journey. We definitely need some more men to go on that journey. So if that is something that you would consider doing, uh, just come and talk to me. Our prayer focus this month has been the orphans of Guatemala. And so I hope that you've been praying for them and been praying for our uh, partner there, uh, Hope for Tomorrow Children's Home. This is one of the main people that we work with when we go to Guatemala. Um, so continue to just pray for them and lift them up. Um, this is our time in the service, our prayer and altar time, where we do exactly what we've just sung about. We just want to be still and be quiet and come before the Lord and um, just recognize his authority in our life and submit to him and um, bring our uh, requests and our, um, just our thoughts to him and ask him to be with us and guide us for the, for the next week and in the times ahead. And so... Um, in just a moment, we'll do that. Our pastor, Jay, is back with us, and we're so glad for that. And so he'll be up here as well, and you can come and pray for him. But let's take the time to do that now. God, we know that you are the father to the fatherless. And Lord, right now we lift up all of these children in Guatemala, Lord, who, who don't have fathers, don't know who they are, God, have been um, abandoned, neglected, orphaned, God. 
We pray for all of these children that are in orphanages and in children's homes like Hope for Tomorrow. God, we thank you for Kenneth and for his family and for the work that they're doing there tirelessly day in and day out. God, we pray that you would continue to provide for them the things that they need, Lord, um, and especially just a sense that you are with them. God, and that you're guiding and directing them. We pray for wisdom as they make decisions about how to go forward, Lord. Um, God, we thank you. We know that we were all orphaned, God, and that you did not leave us in that state, that you've adopted us into your family. God, we're so grateful for that, for your love and your mercy in our lives. And I pray right now that, God, anyone in this room who, who does not know that, who is not one of your children, God, that today would be the day that you would draw them in. We pray that salvation would happen today in this room, God. We're grateful for our pastor. We're so glad that he's back. And Lord, I just pray that you'd be with him as he prepares to bring the message the third time today, God. Just give him clarity and um, perseverance to get through that, Lord. And uh, thank you for the words that you've put on his heart. And I pray that you would give us hearts to receive those, Lord. We love you and pray all of these things in your name. Amen. Well, good morning, church family. It is good to be back with you. I missed you last Sunday, but don't worry. I was watching you. That's right. We stream online uh, and on Facebook Live. And so I got to watch and participate from afar uh, last Sunday morning. And uh, just so you know, if you're sick or if you're out for whatever reason, it doesn't replace being here, of course, but you can continue to track with us online as well. And I'm grateful to our media team that makes that a reality. Uh, Wade Owens from our Nolensville campus was here to preach and you heard the orchestra uh, last Sunday. Uh, and I always love the orchestra Sunday because I think it is a beautiful picture of the body of Christ. Each one of us playing our part, but together, powerful as a whole. Uh, that's why we use musicians and multiple voices to sing on most Sundays, because that's a picture of individual people bringing their talents and gifts together and doing something together that's greater than just the individual parts. We also have an opportunity for another expression of that reality this coming Saturday. So take your bulletins with me and there at the upper left-hand side you'll see uh, and remind you that we are partnering again this year, all eight of our campuses with the campuses of Mount Zion Baptist Church uh, for Better Together, which is an event to bless the city of Nashville. Uh, and so we provide free backpacks with school supplies, free health screenings, uh, a number of activities Activities for families. We feed the community uh, there in inner city uh, Nashville. And so we would love for you and your family to come and participate. Uh, information and signups are on the website. I know of a couple of our life groups already who are going as a group to go serve next Saturday. Uh, I was there last year. It was a great event. Encourage you to be a part. If you can't make it this Saturday, then know there'll be many opportunities to serve uh, throughout the fall. And so keep, uh, keep up with the church website and the emails and uh, look for those opportunities as well. But as we begin to kind of push reset as the new school year begins, we get into those rhythms. Don't forget the opportunity that we have to be a picture of the body of Christ, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So will you join me as we pray for our tithes and offerings this morning? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the many pictures that we have of how the body of Christ works, whether it's musicians and singers working together, God, to praise your name, whether it's people serving, being the hands and feet of Jesus. God, whatever it is, you have given us the calling and the opportunity to use what you've entrusted to us to make much of you. So I pray that we do that. And at this moment, each and every Sunday is that reminder, that opportunity that we have to give back to you out of all that you've entrusted to us. So use these tithes and offerings to lift high the name of Jesus, because we believe, as your word says, he will draw all men to himself. And it's in his name we pray, amen.
Thank you for that, Jeremy and Mary Beth. The love of the Lord endures. And today we're going to talk about how faith endures. And one of the cool things about being around a while is the enduring relationships you get to build. My very first youth retreat at Brentwood Baptist six and a half, 16 and a half years ago, Jeremy and Mary Beth were worship leaders with a bunch of middle schoolers in Gatlinburg. So give them a hand again for putting up with me for 16 and a half years. But... Uh, it has been cool just to see their ministry grow and their family grow, and uh, it's fun when you get to be around that long. So as we get into James chapter 5, we are moving towards, of course, the end of this letter and the end of our uh, summer sermon series. So we're going to look at the first half of chapter 5 this morning, and the back half next week as we get set to go back to school and launch into another series on disciple making. But uh, man, there's a lot that James has uh, for us before we get there. And so as you've already heard, uh, this has been vacation week for our family. Uh, as Eliza's turned 18 years old, we've realized this is the time that we want to be sure we build those family memories. And so this year found us going to my wife's neck of the woods where she is from. And so again, this word endurance applies when you spend over 2000 miles in a minivan with your kids for a week, uh, moving from location to location. We were in my wife's hometown. We attended my wife's home church. We went up into uh, North, uh, North Central Wisconsin where my wife used to serve at a Christian camp. Uh, we came back down through Chicago and spent a couple of days there. Wonderful place to visit, but you're always glad to get out of the city, right? And breathe a little easier. Uh, but one of the visits that we just had to make there was to see some of the famous sites. And so we went to Grant Park. Our hotel was near there. We went walking with the kids in the northwest corner. They've built something called Millennium Park to honor the turn of the century. And there is a famous structure that is officially called Cloudgate, but nobody knows it as that. They just call it the Bean. 
because it is a big shining piece of metal that looks like a bean that reflects the Chicago skyline. So here's the obligatory family photo, right, uh, of us standing in front of the bean, uh, which is like the world's largest mirror and the world's largest place to take selfies because everybody's now gathered around looking at the different angles and objects and taking pictures of themselves. And so uh, we went up underneath it and we were trying to do the same thing. And you guys, I'm really bad at the whole camera angle, take a selfie thing. So, but I grabbed my wife and Tanya, I said, we should take a picture right here. And so I was trying to figure it out and I was trying to hold it. You know, usually my girls are just like, dad, give us that camera. You know, we know how to do this, but I couldn't get it quite right. And so she said, where do you want me to look? And she was holding a cup of coffee. And so I swung my arm up to point where I wanted her to look. It hit the bottom of that cup of coffee. That thing flew up in the air in front of my face. And it was like slow motion on a movie, right? It levitated. It went, and it kind of hung there for a minute. And then I watched as it dropped to the ground. It didn't spill. This cup of coffee exploded like a grenade at my feet. And so coffee went all over my shoes, my legs, my shorts. The tourists, instead of taking pictures of the bean, they were taking pictures of me, right? (laughs) Stupid American with my coffee all over me. As we were rocking around the magnificent mile, I could just see people going, do I, do I smell coffee, right, all day long? Yeah, because I'm soaked in it. It's all over me. I was a sticky mess. And as we get into James chapter 5 today, his words, he doesn't just ease in, right? His words explode off the page. Some of the harshest language in the entire New Testament. Words that are designed to stick with us for a long, long time. Stand with me in honor of God's word as we read from James, the fifth chapter. Verses 1 through 11. Come now, you rich people. Weep and wail over the miseries that are coming on you. Your wealth is rotted and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded. And their corrosion will be like a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have stored up treasure in the last days. Look. The pay that you withheld from the workers who mowed your fields cries out, and the outcry of the harvesters has reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and have indulged yourselves. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and you have murdered the righteous who does not resist you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains? You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. Brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. Brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering patience. See, we count as blessed those who have endured. You have heard of Job's endurance and have seen the outcome that the Lord brought about. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you that James wrote to real people with real questions and real struggles. Father, in a world that we look around and we say things seem so unfair, help us to look to the examples of those who have been faithful to you and not those who have merely accumulated stuff in this world. So God, teach us that a faith that endures develops patience and trust in all of your promises. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. So one of the things that you have to love about James is his boldness. And what some scholars call the most seething language in the New Testament, he launches into chapter 5. Now, what's interesting is, contextually, if you read very, very closely, in these verses, he doesn't address his audience as brothers and sisters. Instead, he says, you rich people. And so who James is addressing here, unlike the rest of the letter, is actually the rich people who were oppressing the early church. 
And so why would he spend valuable real estate in a letter like this to write to those people? Well, for a couple of reasons. One, he wants us to overhear God's condemnation of those who put their trust in wealth. But number two, he also wants it to serve as an indirect reminder to all of us who are Christians. I would argue now in an age of wealth, in a community of wealth, in a nation of wealth, that we have a responsibility to use our wealth wisely and justly. And so don't let yourself off the hook as we read this. Yes, he's specifically addressing those who are outside of the church, outside of the faith, oppressing people by their desire to gain wealth and resources. But it also applies to us. And so point number one this morning, faith that endures, faith that perseveres, recognizes and discerns that wealth can be a good gift, but an extremely, extremely, extremely dangerous idol. Wealth is a good gift. Money is a gift from God that he gives us to meet our needs, to take care of our families, to fuel and to fund the resources needed for his kingdom. But if we allow money to take over in our hearts, it is an extremely, extremely dangerous idol. Hence the strong, strong language here. Come now, you rich people, weep and wail over the miseries that are coming on you. Who does James sound like? A prophet. He is his prophetic language. I remember when text messaging first started to be a thing, I had a thing or two to learn. I remember when it first kind of came out, I was like, who in the world would take time to text message when you can just call somebody, right? And right now, everybody who's like me, 40 and above, they're like, yeah, we feel you. Everybody who's like 40 and under, they're like, what are you talking about? We've always texted, right? We've never really talked on our phones. Well, all we do is text on them. Because back in the old days, it was like, okay, uh, I got to hit the one button three times to find the letter I want. And now I got to go to number five and I got to hit it three times. Remember those old keyboards? Well, as technology improved, texting became the thing. And so I remember one time on one of my old phones, I accidentally had somehow turned my caps lock on. And my kids were like, Dad, why are you shouting at us in every text message? It's like, what do you mean? They were like, you're, you're, you're texting in all caps. That means you're yelling at us. I was like, I didn't know. I just thought that that's what I was typing, right? That's just what was coming through. Well, what James is doing here is he is writing in all caps. He is not just talking. He is urgent in his message to those rich oppressors. People who would gain selfishly at the cost of others. He says, your wealth is rotted and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you. So his first indictment is this. You are hoarding. In the ancient world, there were three primary ways that you accumulated wealth. You harvested grain, which he says here is rotting. Your fancy clothes made out of luxury materials, right? They're being eaten by moths. And your precious metals, which he says are corroding, which everybody knows, and James knew, that these metals don't really corrode. But what he means is this, is they are corroding your soul. When your life becomes about what you get instead of what you give, it warps you as a person. It distorts your understanding of reality. And it's why the hoarding of accumulation and wealth is so dangerous. Because you think you own your stuff, but is that reality? No. Your stuff owns you. And the amount of time that you work to pay off your stuff, the amount of time that you have to devote to your stuff, the bigger house comes with more work. The boat requires work. All of these things that we accumulate, right? Fancier automobiles, they have to be taken care of. They cost more to operate. All of these things we think are statuses. We think they are status symbols, but in reality, they just take life from us. And that's what James is telling those who would seek to accumulate stuff. Then he goes after those who are unfair employers. Verse four, look, the pay that you withheld from the workers who mowed your field cries out and the outcry of the harvesters has reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You can also translate that the Lord of armies. 
So there are those of us who have the responsibility of people who work for us. And so it's a reminder that we are called to treat them justly in the ancient world. If you forgot to pay a worker for his day of labor, you might not think it's a big deal. But it was to him. You know why? Because he had to feed himself and his family on that day's wages. And so don't think that God overlooks those who have responsibility for employees, treating them justly and fairly. James reminds us that God sees and that God knows and that God cares. Then in verse five, he deals with extravagance. And this one in particular is convicting to all of us in our culture. It says, you have lived luxuriously on the earth and have indulged yourselves. You have fattened your own hearts in the day of slaughter. It's interesting, and here's the gut check, and it was a gut check for me as I was preparing this sermon. If the Lord gives you more, you get a bonus, you get a pay increase, you get a windfall, you receive an inheritance, you get a raise. What is your first thought? What is your first inclination? Am I going to use that so I can increase my standard of living? Or is your first thought, did God entrust me with more so I could increase my standard of giving? But we somehow always forget the second part of that. Abraham was blessed, why? To be a blessing to others. And so has it ever occurred to you that God gives us more, not so that we can live more indulgently, more extravagantly, but so that we can have more to give to those who are in need? Walking the city streets of Chicago this week, our son was moved deeply by the people who were there, homeless and on the street with their signs begging. And it was wonderful, teachable moments for us to talk about those people and that situation and the ministries that we sponsor to be sure that those people don't just get first thoughts in our culture are often towards ourselves. And let me remind you once again, I know it's so tempting in our little bubble of a world to think, you know what? Uh, this pastor isn't really talking about me. I'm not that wealthy. I mean, other people in our community have bigger houses, drive nicer cars. I mean, just look around us at Middle Tennessee. We really don't have that much. Let me remind you, if you make $10,000 a year as a household, you are in the top 50% of wealth in the world. If your household makes $50,000 a year, you are in the top 1% of wage earners in the world. Don't just take our little microscopic view, zoom out and see what God sees. He's entrusted much to us. We are Christians living in an area of wealth, in a nation of wealth, in an age of wealth, and we have a responsibility to be sure that we're using that, not to just consume and overfeed and over wealth here. Let's not swing to the extreme, right? God does give us money. Money is actually values neutral. Look with me at 1 Timothy chapter 6. I think this is one of the clearest places in the New Testament on teaching these principles and issues. It's to remind us that God does give us money. Money in and itself is not inherently evil, but Jesus warned us in the Sermon on the Mount, the brother of James, Jesus warned us that you can't serve two masters. And so Timothy reminds us, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. So if you want to gain something, if you want to pursue something, pursue godliness and contentment. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out. If we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. What's our point? Wealth is an extremely dangerous idol. And here's one of the most misquoted verses in the entire New Testament, verse 10. For the love of money, not just money, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Then look at verse 17. So what do we do? Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God. You see, tomorrow we could wake up, the stock market could crash, your savings, your retirement, your house value, it could all be gone. 
So don't put your trust in those things. Instead, put it on God who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Not just to have, but to enjoy, to be appreciative for what he's entrusted to us. Instruct them to instead do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. You see, James is saying the early church is looking at these rich oppressors and saying, man, look at the life that they lead. James is saying that's not life. And God knows and he sees. So don't put your trust in those things. Instead, point number two, enduring faith develops patience. Enduring faith develops a patience that relentlessly trusts in God's timing. That relentlessly trusts in God's timing. There it is in verse seven. Verse one, I'll give you a second to all take a good look at that word. What's the word there? Therefore, my favorite word. Based on this reality, therefore, now, brothers and sisters, sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. Now this word patience, and it's several times here in the next few verses, you may want to underline and highlight it clearly, it's the theme. Let's all go ahead and confess, none of us like to be patient. We want it and we want it now. Information, if my phone doesn't dial it up quick enough, right? I grow impatient. Microwaves aren't quick enough to cook my meals. Our roads here certainly aren't adequate enough for me to get to where I need to go because I want to get there in a hurry, amen? Patience is not anything that any of us in and of ourselves like to cultivate, but it's a reality of the world in which we live. And we have to be patient as we wait for what? The Lord's coming. Final justice for the author to step on the stage once and for all. And it's interesting that there's three words in the New Testament for the second coming. A lot of us don't realize this. One word is the word where we get the word epiphany, epiphania, that is the idea of a sudden, right, appearance. And so it emphasizes the urgency with which we are to live until Christ's coming. The second word is apocalypsis, is where we get the word apocalypse, like revelation, which is an unveiled word here. And this is the word that's used here and 13 other times in the New Testament is the word parousia, which means a royal arrival. Right up once again. And so be patient. Know your king is returning. He's coming back. So hold on to him. Don't hold on to this. He uses the example of a farmer. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early. They had planted the seed, they had pulled the weeds or sprayed their, their, for, for weeds, those kind of things. But the reality is, is they could not make it rain. And yet, I like to make stuff happen. I don't want to wait for it. So what an appropriate word picture to say there are certain things that we simply have to wait. Like those farmers, I am praying for that rain because I'm cultivating a relationship with my heavenly father. As I wait patiently, I'm still faithful to share the gospel and to sow the seed, knowing that in God's timing, some of that seed is going to produce a harvest. I come back today, it might be a couple of days from now, it might be a few hundred years from now, but he is coming and so there is a posture that we have to Brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. So as we wait, let's not use up our emotional energy arguing and fight, wound each other in the process, but instead let's use that to focus our heart and our mind on him, which leads us to the third reality. Remind us that God is indeed compassionate and merciful, even if you can't see it in the here and in the now. You think about the prophets, they are a great example. And it stretched Job's faith. Job wasn't flawless, but he was faithful. And in his faithfulness, it was revealed for him a deeper understanding of faith, 
of who God was, who his nature and what his nature truly was. And so Job has stood the test of time as the example for us of someone who at the end received God's compassion and mercy so that God's glory would be made great. And so it's interesting if you think about it the effect that the suffering and challenges have on our life. In a book called Jesus Rediscovered, an author by the name of Malcolm Mudd, the hope that we have in Christ. Because we realize that the wealth, they hoard things. They live extravagantly. You might become rich. Would you bow your heads with me this morning as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper? In just a few moments, our deacons will come and they will us. And so we don't have to hoard because all of the riches of your kingdom are available to us.